Hey guys, welcome back to another video and today we're going to be building a very very basic neural network which takes a picture of some sort of clothing item and it's going to try to predict what it is. So let's say you give it an item, it's going to try to predict whether it's a pant, t-shirt, shirt, so on and so forth. So I just want to mention two things before I start. One, all the resources are going to be down in the description if you want to follow along. And two, I try to make this video as simple as possible so that anyone, whether you have coding knowledge or not, can understand it. Okay, so let's just get started. More specifically, we're going to be building a deep neural network. And what exactly is a deep neural network? Well, think of it as a network of several different layers. And there are three very distinct layers in a deep neural network. In the beginning, we start off with an input layer. So what is this input? It could be anything. It could be some sort of data. It could be some sort of image, whatever your input is. Then afterwards, in the middle, you have some sort of hidden layer. So this could have one layer or several different layers. And we don't really know what happens here, but think of it as some sort of magical layer where the computer is building these connections, trying to make sense of your input data. And finally, that leads us to our last and final output layer. So in our output layer, we output whatever we're looking for. So in this case, our output layer is going to consist of the predictions of what type of clothing item it is. Let's now take a look at our code real quick. So we're gonna import TensorFlow. Uh, we're also gonna import NumPy, which is basically a library which deals with all sort of numbers based stuff. And then we're also going to import something called matplotlib. And the whole purpose of that is to plot our figures. And the version of TensorFlow we're using is 2.3.0. Okay, so now we get to the data part of it. So what data are we actually gonna use? And when it comes to a neural network or any deep learning type of stuff, the data you use is very important. And for our case, we're going to be using something. It's a pre-built data set called the Fashion MNIST data set. So this is a very widely and popular used data set. And this is how it looks. So we have pictures of t-shirts, we have pants, we have uh, jackets, we have dresses, we have shoes, uh, handbags. There's a lot of things. And this data consists of a total of 70,000 images. And that's really good. But the more fantastic thing about this data is this is what you call your ideal data. This data is perfect by every means. All the pictures are in between. They're all the same sizes. They're all the same color. Everything is grayscale. So uh, there's no other uh, obstruction. So because you only have the image, you don't have any other sort of like distractions or whatever it may be. So this over here is your perfect data set. And the truth is when you're doing some sort of real modeling, you're not going to get a data set which is as perfect as this. But this makes it amazing for learning purposes. So this is the data that we're going to be using. And what we're going to do is, so this data is really popular and it's already inbuilt into TensorFlow. So we're just going to get it. So MNIST equals tf.keras dataset.fashion MNIST. So this data set is already loaded into our TensorFlow library. So we're just going to grab it from that. And over here, we're going to notice that we have two different data sets. So we have training images and we have the labels for it. And we have test images and the labels for it. Now, you might be asking, well, why do we have two different things? And the answer to that is very simple. So in the beginning, we're going to train our model on the training data set. So that's what our training data set for, is for. But so what, after we trained our model, we kind of want to test it in some way. So in that case, we're going to give it a completely unseen data set. And we're going to test our model on that unseen data set to get the best results. So this is all we're doing. We're loading in our data right now. So now let's just take a quick look at our training images. So as you can see here, these are just a ton of NumPy arrays. So each value corresponds to one pixel and, the, and they're given values from zero all the way to 255. So this is how uh, our data looks like. And these are the labels we have. So we have several different labels. So instead now what we're going to do is let's look at the length of it. So this is going to be for our training data set. So our training data set has 60,000 images and our testing data set has 10,000 images. So we have that. Now let's look at how just one instance of our data looks like. 
So over here, I'm going to pull out whatever is at the zeroth index. So let's just print that out. And this is how our data looks like. So this is the picture of whatever is at our zeroth index. So we have values starting from zero all the way to 255, which represents different shades of the color gray, since our image is grayscaled. So we have this over here, and this has a training label of nine. So what do these labels actually mean? And in simple words, they tell us what the image is. So over here, the number zero represents a t-shirt or a top. A, a number one represents a trouser, two represents a pullover, and so on and so forth. You can just read it over here. So why are we using numbers and why can't we just call it a dress? And the answer to that is pretty simple, is so that our data can be widely used. A dress is not called a dress everywhere around the world. So that's all, that's why we're using numbers and this is the reason for it. So now let's just look at one of our uh, images. So I'm gonna use uh, our matplotlib in order to plot it. So let's just go to whatever's at a 3456th index. And when you run that, we get this. So this is a top and we're also printing out the label. So it has a label of number six. So that means that this is a shirt. So let's take another example. Uh, let's just go to whatever is at the hundredth index, for example. So hundredth index, now let's print this out. So at the hundredth index, we have this, which has a label of eight. And if we go to our uh, dictionary per se, the whatever is at the eighth index is a bag. So, so on and so forth, you can change the numbers and just look at what the data looks like. Okay. Now what we're gonna do is, we're gonna normalize our data. So if you noticed, all our images have values between zero to 255. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna normalize our data so that everything is from zero to one and that's it. And the purpose of this, the main purpose is that it speeds up the learning process and we get the more optimized result faster. So to order, in order to do that, we're just gonna divide each and every element by 255. So over here, we're uh, dividing our training set by 255. We're also dividing our test images by 255. So now our data is just from zero through one. Okay, so now our data is ready to use. So we're done pre-processing our data and we have everything ready to use. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna move on to the second step, which is building our model. So this is how our model is going to look like. It's really simple. So what we're gonna do is, like I showed you earlier, our data is in a form of a NumPy array. And this array is 28 by 28. But when we're giving it, when we're giving our model the data, we want to give it in a single array. So what we're going to do is we're going to convert this 28 by 28 array into a one dimensional single array. So what we're going to, so that's going to be done using this function. So tf.keras.layers.flatten. So it's gonna take our 28 by 28 and it's gonna make it a single dimensional array of 784. Okay, so that's what flatten does. Then after that, we're going to add a dense layer. Now, what is this layer going to be? This is going to be our hidden layer. So we're gonna give it 520 neurons. So you can just play around with this number, experiment different numbers. So we're gonna give it 520 neurons, or think of it as 520 different connections. And over here, we give it something called an activation function. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. So what you can do over here, just to experiment if you want to, you can add more layers. So just copy this and add one more. Change the numbers, you can play around with the numbers. It does not matter what it is. You could have something with this many neurons. It really does not matter. Well, it, it's gonna change your uh, number. It's gonna change your output, but it's still going to work. That's my point. And now finally, we reached our end layer. So this over here is our final output layer. Now over here, you can notice we have 10 neurons and we cannot change this number. Well, why is it only 10? Is there a reason for that? There is. So now let's just go back to our um, labels over here. And how many labels do we have? We have a total of 10 labels, starting from zero all the way through nine. So what our output is going to do, it's also going to have to have 10 labels. And also notice one thing over here, our activation function is different for our output. 
So if you want to see, you can do model.summary and it's going to show you a quick summary. So we're going to come back to this because we first need to build our model. Okay, now let's go to these terms. So as you can see, we have sequential over here. And the reason it's called sequential is because we have different sequence of layers in our neural network. Then we have flatten, which like I said, takes our 28 by 28, makes it one dimensional. So then over here, we have ReLU. So ReLU is the activation function that we're using. And what it's going to do, ReLU is going to make sure that we do not have any negative values. So if a value is less than zero, it's going to be given a value of zero. But if the value is greater than zero, we're going to just output whatever that value is. So that's the ReLU activation function. And then we have something called softmax. And all it is, is let's say you have these values, 10, 20, 30, 10, 500, and zero. It's going to look for whatever the maximum value is. In this case, 500 is the maximum value. So what it's gonna do is gonna make everything have a value of zero, except for whatever has the maximum value is going to turn into the value one. So in this case, 10 becomes zero, 20 becomes zero, 30 becomes zero, 10 also becomes zero, but 500 becomes one since it has the highest value. And then zero remains zero. Okay, so over here, we're gonna compile our model and the, we're gonna call an optimizer. And what does an optimizer do? So what it does is each step of our process is gonna try to decrease the loss and increase our accuracy. So we're gonna be using the Atom optimizer, which is a really popular optimizer. And then we have something called uh, loss. And all losses in simple words, it's the amount of predicted error we have. And we always wanna decrease our loss in each step of our process. And afterwards, we're going to fit our model. And we're gonna fit it, uh, so to fit it, we're gonna give it, where do we wanna fit it? We wanna fit it to our training images. Then we're gonna give it the training labels for it. And then we have something called epochs. And what epochs is, it's in simple words, it's just the number of steps. So if you give it 100 epochs, it's gonna go through our model 100 times. So it's gonna do both forward propagation and back propagation for a total of 100 times. So we're just gonna keep it simple and make it five. But you could play around with this and see how changing the number increases or decreases our accuracy. So as you can see, our model is getting fit right now and you can uh, look at the fluctuations in our loss. So right now our loss is at 47%. And see, as you see, each epoch, our loss is decreasing slowly and slowly. So by the ending, we have a loss of 27%. And for just a few seconds worth of work, that's actually really good. Now that we're done building our model, this is how the model.summary looks like. And all it is, it's a summary of each of the layers and how the output looks like. So now let's see how does our model compare. And in order to compare or test our model per se, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna run it through, but this time, we're gonna run it through our test images. Remember that we did not show it our test images yet. So this is completely unseen data. So we're gonna run model.evaluate on our test images and we're gonna give it the test labels. And all it's gonna do is gonna check whether what its prediction is, is the same as the label. So let's run that real quick. And as you can see, we got a loss of 33. So that's 33%. And that's not too bad given that we have a very, very basic neural network. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna see how well our model is at predicting. But before we do that, I just wanna show you something real quick. So this is how our values are going to look like when they come from our output. So this is what it looks like. So over here, we have a value of four multiplied by 10 to the power of negative one. Then we have this and so on and so forth. And we have a total of 10 values. And what do these values represent? In simple words, each of these values belong to the probability that the item corresponds to that index. So as you remember earlier, we have at the zeroth index, we have some sort of, so if we scroll up real quick over here, so at the zeroth index, we have a t-shirt. First index, trouser, at the ninth index, ankle boot. Okay, so let's just take a quick example over here. So what this is saying, in other words, is at the zeroth index, it thinks that the probability of it being that object is this much and so on and so forth. It does this for each and every item. 
So what are we going to return as? So we can only come up with one answer, right? And that answer is going to be whatever the maximum value is. So our answer or our prediction by our model is going to be whatever has the highest probability. And in this case, let's take a look at what actually has the highest probability. So our prediction over here is six, but the actual, actual answer is zero. So we weren't able to get it, but if you look over here, if you go to whatever's at the sixth index, so zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this over here, this one has the highest value compared to everything else. So now let's just try something different. Okay, so for example, let's look at whatever is at the 69th index. So let's run it. And our prediction is eight, and the actual answer is also eight. So over here, our model was correct. And if you look at it carefully, let's go to this uh, eighth index. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And this actually has a really high probability. And it has a 100% probability, actually. So that's why it predicted the value 8. And you can just keep playing along, uh, look at different values, and see how well our model is. But as it is, this is a very basic model. Uh, in order to make it more better and more generalized, per se, you could use something called convolutions. And there's several other different techniques that we could add to our existing model to make it a lot better. But the purpose of this video was to try to make it really simple and it's kind of just like an introduction. So the code is down below. You can try to just play, uh, look at it or change its values. And yeah, so thanks a lot for watching and do let me know what you thought about the video. And, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you.